June 1944, the English Channel. A bridge of Allied supply ships streamed into Normandy, and the beachhead grew. A week after D-Day, half a million men and their weapons had landed in France. Strengthening the beachhead by advances up to 20 miles, their goal was victory in Europe. Our aviation engineers had followed the assault waves in. Work began on the landing strips as soon as we unloaded our equipment. Some emergency runways were ready for operations in six hours. Around us, the Signal Corps boys strung up over a mile of wire every minute. Communications, reinforcements and supplies were building up for a powerful offensive designed to break out of the bulging Normandy pocket. We pushed south to gain elbow room. But the planned advance by 1st Army Commander General Bradley was falling behind Eisenhower's timetable. We kept jabbing toward San Lo in rough hedgerow country a stubborn struggle against strong enemy resistance. The Germans, although one counterattack was smashed, rallied again. They ordered up crack parachute regiments and panzer divisions to seal off the Allied beachhead. Hitler ordered his divisions to hold and force a stalemate. Methodically, they scoured the front with fire to prevent any break through San Lo. German fire was effective. Roads and communications blocked, the Allied advance far down the line came to a halt. These were the worst days of the bloody Normandy campaign. The ground troops dug in and waited for a break. Those of us in Pete Casada's 9th Tactical Command had been waiting too. Now, clearing weather gave us a chance to crack the San Lo block. 300 fighter bombers in half an hour. Following us were the heavies. 1,500 were to pass over the target within 60 minutes. A plane every two seconds. Cobra was the plan name. With it, Eisenhower hoped to demoralize the enemy in a sector five miles long and one mile wide. Including medium bombers, nearly 2,400 planes wove this carpet of bombs. Carpet bombing worked. Now General George Patton could deploy his armored columns for a dash across France. But his right flank would be open. So he made a deal with air for close support. Assured that General Opie Whelan's 19th Tactical Air Command would provide fighter bomber protection, Patton plunged towards Germany 400 miles away. This signaled the start of air tank warfare with extraordinarily successful results. fighter bomber acted as the eyes of an armored column and communicated by radio phone. Our job was to attack enemy concentrations in advance of our ground forces.
By early September, the Allies, clear of the hedgerows and in command of the situation, now pursued the enemy. Protected and supplied by air, the mobile U.S. Third Army in one month was at the doorstep to Germany. Air tank teams in their famous dash across France had opened a road to freedom. For the first time in military history, an entire German division quit fighting because of pressure from the air. Credit for these punishing attacks goes to the 19th Tactical Air Command. The formal surrender ceremony at Beaugency Bridge was held up until General Whelan could attend. Our 405th Fighter Bomber Group had persuaded German General Elster to surrender his division, consisting of 20,000 officers and men. Major General Robert Macon represented the Allies in this unique ceremony. As for the German and his troops, they were the victims of three weeks of incessant air attacks which had protected Patton's right flank. Accordingly and appropriately, General Wayland, head of the 19th Tactical Air Command, proudly represented his outfit at the ceremony. Their strafing attacks especially helped cage the enemy spirit. From England and the continent, the directive under which we opened our autumn campaign put German oil in first priority. Next on our target list came munition plants, transportation, and aircraft factories. Our orders were to flatten what was left of enemy war production. factories, with hoarded gasoline, with 350 airfields, the Germans again had air power. General Spots reported to Washington that the German Air Force had more fighter planes toward the end of 1944 than ever in its history. On several occasions, the Luftwaffe showed that its new strength could be brought to bear against American bomber formations daring rage at his fighter commanders, calling them cowards and threatened to transfer them into the infantry. Even so, he began to employ his forces in large, concentrated air battles. Eight Air Force bombers pushed through to deliver our knockout punch. When a 
American air superiority couldn't be shaken. Germany was about to suffer the hell she herself had created. into flaming oblivion. shot its last boat. There was blood in the skies over Germany. German blood. Our final air campaigns now swoop down to spread the paralysis of defeat. war machine, led by ruthless men who had sought to dominate the world, was overwhelmed and crushed to a degree never before experienced in the history of modern war. With final capitulation by German leaders, a great war had been won. The men who won it, the Allied armies, navies, and air forces, had triumphed over a host of relentless, desperate, and powerful enemies. At the Berlin surrender, the U.S. Air Force was ably represented by General Spots, who helped lead the Allied air supremacy, which had trampled out the path to victory in Europe. Air power, according to General Hap Arnold, was our margin of success. On this VE Day, he reminded the free world never to forget those men who gave their lives for this victory. was in Japanese hands. It was for bases like these that American soldiers, sailors, and Marines had fought the costly battle. On Columbus Day, 1944, B-29s discovered Saipan. Our arrival was a real historic event, celebrated with a ballad by a local poet, and it went like this. On the 12th of October, back in 1944, the citizens of Saipan heard a great four-engine roar. Bulldozers fled the runway. The soldiers stopped to cheer as down came Jolton Josie, the Pacific pioneer. It was a great day for the aviation engineers and service groups who had hacked the airfield out of jungle. To them, Jolton Josie was a sensation who shamelessly stole the show. Some Jap officials already knew that Saipan, as an American base, with its threat of aerial bombardment, spelled eventual defeat for Japan. The landing of the B-29s gave reality to that threat. The new arrivals were men who had flown fortresses and liberators in all theaters of war. They were led by a former 1928 flying cadet, who in 1944 was named Deputy Chief of Air Staff and was now commanding the 21st Bomber Command, General Haywood Hansel. Well, the, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talk. Thank you. All over the Marianas, B-29s were getting ready to carry out the General's promise. Saipan, Tinian, and Guam had been seized by Admiral Nimitz forces for the primary purpose of serving as bases for the very long-range bombers 
now parked on circular heart stands. The 21st was building up its massive air power as it prepared for the ultimate crushing defeat of Japan. The long arm of the 73rd Bombardment Wing, led by General Rosie O'Donnell, began punching the enemy with appalling strength. Behind this strength was more than bombs and bullets. There was planning. In January, the 21st Bomber Command changed hands. Major General Curtis E. LeMay replaced Hansel. By sheer weight of attack, LeMay believed he could force a surrender of Japan. To that end, he ordered a furious pace of operations. Here was his weapon, the Superport, with 2,200 horses warming up in each of its four engines. Designed to carry more destruction and carry it higher, faster, and farther than any bomber before, the B-29s were like artillery pointed at the heart of Japan. Each plane was armed with 12 50 caliber machine guns, a 20 millimeter cannon, and four tons of bombs. Fully armed, the 21st Bomber Command was taking off for Japan. Today, LeMay sent his bombers out in 100 plane formations to hit Kobe, Nagoya, Tokyo. In two months, he increased the attack missions to 200 planes, building to an 800 plane climax. Jap raids had tried to stop the B 29. They might just as well have tried to stop an onrushing typhoon. ever fought over such vastness. We who had battled over Berlin, Ploesti, and Schweinfurt knew it. London to Berlin and back was 1,000 miles. The Foggia Ploesti run, 1150. But Saipan to Tokyo and back was more than 3,000 miles. B-29s were the planes for the job. For all their destructive power, those of us who flew the superports felt they were things of beauty. In flight, our navigators were on the spot. An error of two degrees could put all of us over nothing but ocean in a plane with empty gas tanks. It was a long ride on the longest, toughest bomber missions in the world. As we approached enemy sky, the crews prepared for the deadly business ahead. While making the slow climb to altitude, our gunners warmed up the central fire control system. Inside a superport, you can't see a gun. You fire by remote control. We had electronics, superhuman brain power at the flick of a switch. Then we waited for the Japs. point, Mount Fuji, meant we were 60 miles from Tokyo. The 
leading B-29s found their objective. Now, below us, Tokyo. Tokyo, which the Jap High Command had boasted, was outside the range of land-based American bombers. For six months, we had proved them wrong. with the results of these high-level precision tactics. Suddenly in March, he switched to low-level, nighttime, maximum effort fire raids. And Japan's dreams of world empire went up in a flaming inferno. B-29s burned out the industrial heart of Japan. One by one, 66 principal cities received their devastating bath of fire until Japan's military situation was hopeless. They could not have held out. They had lost control of the air. Their capacity to wage war was destroyed. The fire raids had even killed much of their fanatical resistance. B-29s were making Japan bleed internally. Then President Truman made a grave decision. To deliver a special bomb, field orders were signed by General Twenty. They instructed Colonel Paul Tibbets and his B-29 crew to drop what they called the gimmick. At 0815 on August 6, over military target Hiroshima, Bombardier Major Farabee took over. He was about to drop the atom bomb. unprecedented destructiveness had exploded. Three days later, a second atom bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Atomic energy had made air power all important. Dread were the threats for the future. Strong the requirement for air power. As suddenly as it started, the war came to an end and surrender ceremonies aboard the Missouri. Without being invaded, without losing a foot of homeland, Japan was surely and utterly defeated. Before the atom bomb, before the Soviet entry into the war, Japan was beaten through the forceful application of Allied land, sea, and air power. The Japanese surrender had come so quickly after mounting the B-29 offensive and the atom bomb climax that advocates of air power felt our most optimistic predictions were confirmed. Fully recognizing the contributions by Army and Navy, General Arnold felt that air power's share in the victory may fairly be called decisive. In addition to ushering in the atomic age, the war's end marked one of the revolutionary points in the history of warfare. Control of the air proved to be essential to the success of every major military operation. Coordinated planning and command of ground, sea and air forces, backed up by the full effort of the home front, had enabled the Allies to secure this control of the air. 
Air power is the technical instrument of our country's defense. Air power can also be the instrument of peace. The United States Air Force has made it apparent to any potential aggressor that an attack on the United States would be immediately followed by a devastating air atomic counterblow. The atomic weapon thus makes air power the primary requisite of national survival.